when I did it at Harrison Ford's house. It made the, it makes your heart and your body just goes really weird. The uh, kerosene and water in, in your mouth. I had watched that act since I was a kid. It was yeah. a guy named Haji Ali that would drink a big glass of kerosene and a gallon of water. The kerosene would float on top of his stomach and then he would blow the kerosene out onto a fire and make an enormous fire so it was like a, he was like a human dragon. And then he would use the water to put out the fire. So I was, I was like, whoa, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. So I always wanted to learn that. I still think that's like the most dangerous because just drinking that much, you know, kerosene or lamp oil, which is, they filter the, the, they use chemicals to get rid of the odor. So it's even more dangerous than kerosene, but drinking it and then having it go in your stomach, the problem is the oil residue. So I'm trying to figure out if there's an alcohol base, like a Bacardi 151, which is very flammable, that I can drink, not swallow and then blow the fire out. The fire comes back really quick. So anyway, I'm, I'm working on that for this new show. I'm trying to figure out a solution. Have you ever been, when you've had the kerosene down in you, like freaking out a little bit? Yeah. When I did it at Harrison Ford's house, it, made the, it makes your heart and your body just goes really weird. Yeah, so that, I think that was probably the last time that I drank that much kerosene. The bullet catch, which you've done on a couple of occasions. Yeah, uh, this guy, this is him, Billy Robinson, and this is him as Chung Ling Su, and he played a Chinese conjurer because 100 years ago, if you were from China and a magician, you're very mysterious, very interesting, so he wouldn't speak, and he would do the bullet catch on stage, and I thought it was so nice the way he did it, though. It was so cool looking. He'd have them shoot him from the audience, and it was like a a path that went out into the audience straight towards him. And he was in London performing the bullet catch and the bullet catch went wrong, struck him, and he yelled, someone close, someone lower the curtain, I've been shot. And suddenly he sounded like an American. And the whole audience laughed, they thought he was kidding, they thought it was funny. Then he dropped dead on stage in front of everybody. And see how he did it, it just looks, it did look so cool. You see? Yeah. So it's kind of like that story about Chung Ling Su's bullet catch and the story about Robert Houdin. There's such a rich history of it, so I wanted to do it, but. And presumably there's even less opportunity for precision. Well, he did it as a trick. Yeah. He didn't really catch it. So the guy that I studied with was named Carl Skeens, and he did it on That's Incredible. And he had his wife shoot him in a metal cup in his mouth, and he had done it hundreds of times, so I had him help me figure out a way to do it for real, which is put a metal cup in your mouth, have a bullet shot into the metal cup, and then I started thinking, but if I'm gonna do this on stage, I think I have to do it to myself. And I started thinking, if you put a string onto the trigger, put a laser on a scope, and then, you know. <laughs> I, I believe your head of production temporarily quit. Yeah, uh, my, my, my top magician consultant. He said, if you do this again, we're, we're, I'm not helping you at all. All right, you okay? The f***ing broke. Never again. Really? I know. David, we're not doing it again. Of course we are. We're not doing Why it did again. I, I quit. You can't I'm doing it right now. And then that, and then just the, all the gun violence and everything, it made me reluctant. I'm like, no, forget this. What was the scariest part of the times you've done it? I think that the scary part is before the fact, not when you're doing it. When you're first trying to actually solidify the idea, I think that's kind of, you know, you're like, Who, how am I gonna do this, Who, you know? So, so the assembly of it, but it was like when I did the balloon flight, when my daughter came, the whole thing was dialed in and safe and perfect, so there would be no risk of, of really anything. We worked really hard to get there. But leading up to it, I had to do almost 500 jumps and it had to be done quickly. So we were doing 10, 12 a day. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I had to get a pro rating so I could jump over a congested area. And you aren't insured for much I of I couldn't that. be insured yeah. for any of that actually. So until the real stunt, but the whole 500 jumps was on me. So that, the scary part was the off the books part that I was doing on my own. Ironically, no injuries whatsoever. <laughs> The first jump that I did recreationally, like a year after the, the balloon stunt, I, I, I was flying with a friend, he was holding on to me so another guy could get a picture of us. 
And then when I came back, I was so far away from a good landing spot that I landed on something just double broke and triple ripped the ligaments on the ankle. So mm. the big injury that I had was just on a recreational jump. But it was also the one time that I didn't treat it very seriously. You know, I wasn't focused and I wasn't prepared. I didn't have my equipment, didn't have my, but what I had done the 500 jumps with. So it just shows you, it's like, you know, that level of focus and seriousness has to be applied at all times.